Yeah, now the newspaper headlines as usual. The Sunday Telegraph here has got a survey of Britain, all these areas where houses have gone shooting up in price and now cost more than a million pounds all over Britain, one part of London. Prices have risen 342% in a decade. Astonishing. And they've got the Mikhail story, which of course a lot of papers have. Sunday Times is a very interesting story here. The Queen and Charles are going to start a job share, it says. This is the beginning of the transition from one reign to the next. And this being Britain, it's being done by merging the press officers. And Prince Charles is going to be in charge of the combined press operation. And of course, in Britain, if you run the press operation, you run the whole shebang. Interesting story there. Scotland on Sunday, not surprising, doing the Kumar story, as you would expect. Mail on Sunday has a story. Uh, a new proposal from the coalition not yet agreed with the Liberal Democrats. You have to speak English or you lose benefits. They're getting rid of multi-language benefits uh, pamphlets that you find all over the place. Um, so pa perhaps talk about that. But as promised, Anne McElvoy and John Simpson, welcome to you both. Anne, your first story. Yes, I'm, I'm starting with Nick Hearn's very good column in the, the Observer. And this is really about whistleblowers, whether it's at the, the BBC or in the NHS. And, and I think he makes a very good point, Andrew, which is what happens at the end of the saga? Who is still around and who is still in post and who is gone? And it's often the whistleblowers, he says, who have bitten the dust. Go. Yes, and this is in the context, John, of the front page of the Observer. Yes, you know, I mean, this is a ghastly story. Ghastly me. story and really painful and... Well, you know, I mean, I went on record quite early on as saying, I think if we're unlucky, this could be the start of a slow death for the BBC. The fact is, I mean, this this uh, uh, article is, um, in fact, uh, uh, a preview of the uh, um, Dame Janet Smith's uh, investigation and it's being published next week. And um, it gives the impression, uh, wrongly, uh, I think, uh, that... Sort of kind of everybody in the BBC was knew it? about it. Well, w well, maybe it was that. It I didn't seem to apply to me, but but um, but also knew about Savile and shut up about it deliberately. Yes. Now I was working at that time, all through that time. I remember what a sleaze bag, nasty p piece of work Savile was. But I, I mean, it didn't occur to me that this, this was going, was going on. on. And I sure that people, that's... it says, were abused by him on BBC uh, on premises. BBC premises. Absolutely astonishing. Yes. I didn't know how they ever got terrible. any programmes out at the time. Terrible, terrible story. Awful. And of course, something should be done, should have been done. And of course, the BBC should have revealed it about itself in Panorama yes. or whatever. It's a difficulty, though, with collective knowledge, isn't it? As you say, you can be around in a place and you can know or sense that you know quite a lot. But actually, coming forward and being brave enough to do something about it is a different matter. Absolutely. Now, we're going to get all the sleaze out of the way early on. There's been a lot of sleaze this week. There's a great story here about the Crystal Methodist, Paul Flowers, who's been tweeting away, Anne. He has been tweeting away merrily, uh, I suppose a, a change from his, his other more damaging activities. He says that he only got his co-op job running the bank because of friends in high places. Who they, we want Who to know. Who they, we may uh, wish to know, given that he was widely uh, seen to be a Labour placeman. I think, apart from the uh, sort of messy and rather tawdry story of Paul Flowers, that the serious point here is, you know, you're talking to Ed Miliband later on, is when people say when they, in politics that they want to do more they want to take over more of the banks. They want to if you want, get a grip on the banks. The difficulty is really how much better are they at making this kind of yeah. appointment or taking this control than the Weasley bankers themselves. He is, of course, an extreme case, and what would happen? He's to an extreme case. I admit but that, but it did happen. And he's promising to write an extreme book. <laughs> uh, I think it's only a matter of time before his extreme book is uh, is there and probably will sling a lot of mud in the direction yeah. of the people who put him into the job. Though one must say that the fault ultimately is his. Since we're talking about complex, sleazy and diff morally difficult cases. Lord Renard is the other one that's all over the papers today, again in the Mail on Sunday, but everywhere else as well. And this is about natural justice in the end, isn't it? Because he's been accused of terrible things, his supporters say there's no evidence, and yet his career is presumably finished. I think this is a fascinating case of a dividing line between a legal standard of proof and a political or perhaps even a moral standard of proof. So you had this, the QC who was asked to assess this for the Lib Dems saying that there was certainly not a, a criminal bar had not been crossed in terms of you couldn't say that he deserved prosecution. And yet you had broadly credible claims by an awful lot of women that they were made to feel distressed and uncomfortable. Now that seems to me a standard at which he 
ought to be out of politics. He is invoking his legal, his legal right, right to stay. Yeah. And we have another advisor here, rather sensible woman, Bridget Harris, very far from being naive or impressionable, who just says, come on, you know, this needs to be dealt with. She doesn't obviously feel that Nick Clegg has dealt with it strongly enough. And that, I think, is where this story is moving. And this is coming just ahead of their, of course, their spring conference. So it has to be dealt with by then. It's not ideal, is it? I don't think Lord Reynard is going to be the favoured guest on the cocktail circuit there. Now, I'm privileged to have two major foreign observers and people who know their stuff. And, John, you've chosen, not surprisingly, the latest ghastly episode in Kabul, two Britons killed in a Taliban massacre. Uh, absolutely dreadful. I was actually I was there at the time. I, was in, I had just got back late last night. Um, I, I know that restaurant very well. My producer, in fact, wanted to go there for dinner that that night on the Friday night. Um, we were just working uh, too late to be able to do it. Um, I mean, the, the real worry, apart from the awfulness of, of the thing itself, um, the real worry is that this does herald some kind of new attempt by the Taliban to get into Kabul. They've not been very good at it. Um, and the, the, actually, the, the Afghan setup is really quite good, the anti-terrorist setup. Um, but in an attempt to make 2014 a, a dreadful year, so it'll look as though the British and Americans are leaving with their tail between their legs. I, you know, one just uh, the, the idea of taking it out on on people like the, this. The nightmare, is, I suppose, is that Afghanistan goes into the same kind of downward spiral as happened in Iraq. Well, I mean, to some extent, I feel uh, perhaps I'm too cynical that that's what. The, the Americans certainly wanted that, that people like me won't... I mean, I haven't been to, to, to uh, Baghdad for nearly a year now. Awful things have happened, but somehow or another nobody it's seems to be interested. drifted away from the news headlines. Yes, and if Afghanistan is the same, that's a real disaster. It is shocking, Anne, how quickly, once the troops are known to be coming out, we lose interest in the West in these wars that we have been so engaged in. I think there's, there's a fair point there, and as John reflects from having been on, on the ground, that is probably getting to be the case in Afghanistan, and also Fallujah coming back into the mm. news, the same old names just washing round again. I think I probably disagree a bit with John saying that's what the Americans want. I think there is a great sense of shame and disappointment. I don't just mean among people who are very committed to sort of invading countries, but that, that it has proved impossible to stabilise large parts of these countries. We must see whether this is, in a sense, a kind of daring one-off in Kabul, or whether there really is a pressure from the Taliban. <laughs> Taliban to, sure. to take back Kabul. But you can't, what you can't do is go into somebody's country, kick them around, change everything, cause disaster, and then go and away back. and say, we don't want to have any more to do with it. OK, place. but then imagine you're David Cameron and you get up and say, all of this is going on, yet more Britons die, and sort of civilians in this case, not even military. Oh, do you know what my reaction is going to be to stay on for an unlimited period? And we've got this terrible crunch, I think, between aspiration and what we're prepared now to tolerate. What pain are we prepared to take? Mm, sad That's story. Um, we'll be talking to Putin later on in the programme, and there's at least one blast against Putin by Barbara Ellen in The Observer. Yes, I mean, she's, uh, she's going for, naturally enough, the one issue that seems most of all, I don't think it is actually the only one, but that, but that seems to divide us most from Putin's Russia, which is uh, this, this kind of ultra-conservative approach to, to gays and gay rights and so forth. Well, I mean, you, you know you went to see him and I'm Indeed. looking forward to seeing this uh, uh, in a moment or two. But, uh, I mean, she says he'd be ab absurd if he wasn't so dangerous. And there, there is an element yeah. of absurdity in the whole thing, isn't there? There's a sort of macho-ness. But yes. he's terribly popular in Russia. This is what we have to remember, of course, Anne, is that he's saying and doing a lot of these things because it plays very well with his core audience at home. Well, I was based in Russia, Andrew, in the years when Putin was rising to power and yeah. you know, basically manipulating a lot of the underlying fears and the despair, really, about the, the Yeltsin years and the, the rapid transition to the market economy, which didn't work out so well for a lot of ordinary people. And what he's expert at is just throwing a sort of cat into the fight. So mm. at this time, it's, it's gays. I know you, you've yeah. talked to, to him about that. So he keeps banging on about this subject, which, frankly, I don't think matters to him at all. I think it's just a very good way, a way of, of, kind of distracting 
distracting from the fact that of all the things that he can, may say he's done for Russia, you know, you have a, an awful lot of impoverished people, you've got a, a corrupt economy, and actually you've got pretty low growth, economic growth, given the mighty potential of Russia. So do you know what? He wants to have a talk about gays I mean, and I, say, I'm effectively that. equate them with paedophiles. It's awful, it's rotten, uh, but he kind of knows that it starts a different conversation to the one he doesn't want yes, to have. I noticed the Russian Foreign Ministry this week accused the EU of queer propaganda, their term, not mine. Mugabe. Mm. We're back with Mugabe, aren't we? I mean, you would think that he would want to choose his friends and allies a little bit more carefully than mm. going on about yeah. uh, in the same way. Well, as was he denies all this. Now, um, benefits. I said right at the beginning of the programme that Benefit Street was the story that had been obsessing Britain. And there's a lot about it, of course, today in the papers. Uh, who, who wants to kick off on this? Um, well, I, actually, <laughs> I, I rather like a column in the... <laughs> Uh, Sunday Mirror, uh, which is Kevin O'Sullivan, who's a very good uh, TV critic, I think. He's got that sort of, you know, needle eye, which sort of cut, cuts through uh, a lot of things that have been said about Benefit Street, when he makes the point that, you know, we're treating it as if it were social documentary, but he said in the same way as my big fat gypsy wedding, he said, you know, you know, who are we kidding here? This is intended to be entertaining television. It may bring home some truths about Britain, some hard truths in the process, but he does make the point. It's carefully edited, it's meant to entertain, and it's designed to shock us. And it's just a, a, a very good point always you know, when one's getting and worked up worth. about these things. And, and talking of people lounging around at home with their TV remote <laughs> controls, you know. <laughs> the Prime um, Minister. You've got the Prime yes. Minister himself. PM, yes. I drive Sam so mad with TV remote control that she walks out of the room. Well, I mean, this happens in the Simpson household, of course, too. Um, I mean, the interesting thing is, I suppose, his, uh, his choice of programmes. He seems to like quite kind of... Well, he says he likes to chop for, to hop from one rubbish programme to another, which, uh, you know... At least some it's of us not... have made our careers. <laughs> some of it the same way. <laughs> yes, at least it's not cookery. Sure. Anyway, mm. he's banned his children from having mobile phones or music and video game devices. And I'm beginning to think I've got this little eight-year-old, yeah. you know, and already starting to uh, to play with all these things. And um, you know, he'll sit at the dinner table and he'd be working away on this. And uh, is that the right thing? I don't know. It's very interesting the difference in culture. You know, Putin likes to kind of sh present himself to the Russians. By by strangling polar bears and sort of <laughs> skiing down vertical mountain faces and so forth. And in this country, we like prime ministers to present be themselves, like us. be like us, watch rubbish television programmes, mm. lounge around a bit. Mm. Can I point out that there is, there is steel? Yeah, exactly. We take away the remote control. That's how hard we are. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> there's a very good bit in the camera. He does try to show a, a bit more steel than he does on the, on the telly front that John's just, just picked up on, where he says uh, about the First World War, which we're endlessly now refighting in this anniversary year, because we've got nothing to worry about about in 2014 mm. in politics, obviously. And he has this line about, he said, oh, he says, you know, it's good that we fought the First World War, whatever people say, because we wouldn't want the Prussians running Europe, which struck me as rather odd as a sort of former <laughs> Berlin correspondent, because we actually have, you know, Germany as the yeah, huge the power in the Eurozone. Yeah. Angela Merkel is a pure Prussian from the east and northeast of Germany. So it's one slightly might, unfortunate choice of words. Yeah, though. one might yeah. argue that we do actually have the Prussians running Europe. Yeah, Whether you like yeah, it or not. Yeah. Mm. All right. Thank you both very much. I'm afraid we've run out of time. Very interesting. We must